Bumper Hornberg, you have no idea what a treat you're in for. How many of you have heard Bumper before? Okay, uh, Jacob Hornberg. <laughs> uh, a lot of people know him as Bumper. I'm not even sure why, <laughs> but that's what he goes by. And my first introduction as a young man was to the Freedom Daily, and that's about probably 91, 92, round in there, that a friend of mine got this, and he would, and whenever he got done reading it, he would give it to me. And I'd read the articles in there and stuff I've read to say, and and you have to understand, in my day, you know, if you had, oh, I know somebody that has a fax machine. <laughs> Seriously, you know, this you guys are. I didn't get my first email until '94, so if you were reading about freedom. If you were trying to understand the issues and concepts that was contrary to what the mainstream media, the media so last century they were saying, you went to things like Freedom Daily. Future Freedom Foundation was supported by a lot of people that supported a lot of stuff that we did in Arizona. We had common friends that, you know, were very big, that I respected a great deal. That was my exposure to Jacob Hornberger was through people that I had already respected as being lovers of freedom, and they would send money. They would do fundraisers. They would advocate people subscribing to his booklet. They would support Jacob Hornberger, so immediately I'm paying attention. Who is this guy? Well, you're going to find out. He is one of the lights, one of the sources, one of the roots of this grapevine that you see now was enormously nurtured, and part of the, what you are benefiting from right now came from Jacob Hornberger. Come on up. The ancient Chinese symbol for crisis perfectly depicts the situation that we're faced with in the United States today. Actually, this symbol was a combination of two separate symbols. One symbol denoted the word danger, and the other symbol denoted the word opportunity. And the Chinese put these two symbols together to form the word crisis. The danger that we're facing in this country today comes in the form of a perfect storm. On one half of that storm is the U.S. government's warfare state. And the other half involves the U.S. government's welfare state. It is a perfect storm that constitutes the greatest threat to our freedom and our well-being in our lifetime. And possibly the history of this country. It is a threat that comes at the hands of our very own government. Consider the warfare state. We now live in a country in which the federal government has the power to detain Americans indefinitely, without a trial, to torture Americans, even to assassinate Americans. As we all know, that's what they're doing to foreigners. Right now, they're assassinating people in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. There's no trial. There's no judicial process. The determination on who's going to be taken out is made by a bureaucrat or a team of bureaucrats. And the determination is final. It's conclusive. Where does this power come from? They say it comes from their so-called war on terror. A war in which they converted a criminal act, terrorism, which is listed in the US code as a crime, 
which is why they've prosecuted people for terrorism for eons. But simply through their announcement that this crime was now converted into an act of war, they say they, that gave them these omnipotent powers. And they have emphasized from the get-go that this is a global war on terror. It's not just limited to Yemen and Pakistan or Africa or Latin America or Europe, that the entire world is the battlefield. And in that message is that right here in the United States, which they say is the primary target of the terrorists, this global war on terror encompasses. A few years ago, they took an American into custody. They turned him over to the military. When he said, I want a lawyer, they said, you don't get no lawyer. This is America. You're an enemy of this country. You don't get a trial either because we have the authority to hold you for the rest of your life under a life sentence with no trial because you're an enemy and we get to make that determination in this new world order. They tortured him using techniques that the CIA and the military had acquired from the North Korean communists who had used them so effectively against American prisoners of war turning their minds into mush and making them confess to crimes they had never committed. Sensory deprivation, goggles, ear, uh, sound suppressors, isolation, what they call touchless torture. But what was most important about this was not just that particular case, but the message that was sent to every American. We not only have the authority to do this to this man, we have the authority to do this to every American. And this mindset was reflected uh, when they assassinated an American traveling in Yemen several years ago, post 9-11, traveling in a car where they just took him out. This mindset was reflected most recently in the case of the Detroit, the alleged Detroit bomber, where the status both liberals and conservatives were saying, turn him over to the military, he's an enemy. He's caught on the battlefield here in the United States. Torture him, do whatever is necessary to make him talk. In other words, what the statists did to Randy Weaver's wife when they put that bullet right into her forehead as she held her baby and was unarmed at Ruby Ridge, Idaho. What they did to Randy Weaver's son when they shot him in the back. Indeed, what they did to those Branch Davidians at Waco when they injected that flammable gas into that building that had all those children in it and then bulldoze the entire site so that there could not be an investigation. They can now do legally and with impunity to anyone they want as long as they label him a terrorist. And don't think that anybody's going to be suing. The survivors are going to be suing like Randy Weaver did when he secured a settlement from the federal government for doing that to his family. Because the courts are holding that now in this new world order, this has implications of national security. And they're never, ever going to force the CIA to reveal the identity of its assassins. I ask you, how can you possibly reconcile the principles of a free society when you live in a society in which the government's got the omnipotent power to torture, rendition, kidnap, detain indefinitely, deny trials, and even assassinate people in that jurisdiction. That's the threat of the warfare state. Over here you've got the threat of the welfare state. The seeds for this socialist system were planted at the turn of the 20th century when the so-called progressives we're importing their socialist ideas primarily from the German socialists. The big revolution, of course, came in the Franklin Roosevelt administration when the primary purpose of government 
became to take money from those who were producing it in order to give it to those who did not produce it? But the big jugular vein for this thing, the twin jugular vein for the welfare state as well as the warfare state, came in the 1910s. For that was when they instituted this twin jugular vein of the income tax and the Federal Reserve System, through which the nurture, the food, the money would be funneled through to fund what is about to come, the socialistic welfare state and, of course, the warfare state. They've got the most brutal, the most vicious agency, or at least one of them, enforcing this income tax, the Internal Revenue Service. You know, it's kind of amusing when they, they were talking about that guy that flew his plane into the building there in Austin, the IRS building. They were, the statists, both liberals and conservatives, were talking about, you know, how angry he was and how frustrated he was, and they were sort of mocking him and so forth. Not one single statist wrote any article on what it is, the horrific things that this vicious agency does to people that drives them into doing a murder-suicide. And it's not the first time. There's countless people that have committed suicide because of the liens, the harassments, the audits, the endless letters, the, the visitations at workplaces, the haranguing of the children the garnishments, all without judicial process. Because you see, the statists can't stand the thought of questioning this agency. This is their lifeblood. This is what funds their machine, their deity. They consider it heretical. You see, everything the IRS does is considered normal and rational and reasonable. We're not supposed to question that. You see, here's how the whole process works. Everybody is over here paying their income taxes all year long, you know, whether it's employer or estimated taxes, and April 15th, we're making up the difference soon. But what's happening is you've got this gigantic fund of money that's being funneled through this jugular vein into Washington. Now, this is a dream come true for a statist. I mean, he's got this gigantic pool of cash ready to distribute in large S to you know, all the fat cat bureaucrats that are walking around and the, the military officials with their, all their medals and everybody trying to get their part of the welfare and the warfare. And, I mean, and then of course stuffing money in the pockets of the politicians that are distributing this money. It's a status dream come true. It's like free money, free large S, grants for your community. And you see, it becomes a gigantic grab fest where everybody, the dependency class, the parasitic class, is over there trying to get their dirty little hands on their share of the money. Let me have my share. No, let me have my share. No, that's my share. And they all get this sense that they're entitled to it. They're entitled to live off the fruits of other people's earnings. That's why they call it an entitlement. Because they honestly believe in their minds that they are entitled to your money. And they're fighting for it. They're grabbing for it. But you know what ends up happening? This dependency class starts getting larger and larger. And their wants become more and more voracious. I mean, you talk about greed. <laughs> I mean, this is the greed class. And, and what happens is that they run out of money. They don't have enough money to satisfy the dependency class. And the liberal staters are saying, tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. But you see, they start figuring out that at some point, you don't have any more rich to tax, that they start cratering in on themselves, as has happened in the welfare state in Greece. They say tax the middle class, but you see they know that the middle class historically has sometimes had revolts and even revolutions over exorbitant taxes. So what they do is they go out and start borrowing the money. And they borrow and they borrow and they borrow to start passing out this largesse. Now let, now let me digress a minute here to tell you about one aspect of these status. Status are fascinating people, you know. They, uh, and they, 40 years ago, they sent 40,000 people of my generation to their deaths, both liberals and conservatives. 
in, in this idiotic, stupid, immoral war in Southeast Asia. And they're still proud of it. Some of them still extol it and praise it and so forth. And they still praise and extol Lyndon Johnson, status par excellence, Richard Nixon, status par excellence. There's no shame. And notwithstanding the fact that it was all based on lies. I mean, you know, like they made up this attack at the place called the Gulf of Tonkin. And they said, we've been attacked, we've been attacked. And they knew there'd, there'd been no attack. But it was all designed to get a resolution to use force. No declaration of war, as the Constitution requires. But a resolution to use force, that sounds kind of familiar, you know. Uh, that justified a war that went on and killed 58,000 American men. Well, the rationale they were using is because of communism. They were, oh, communism's horrific. And they were right. I mean, communism is horrific. But they were saying, the dominoes will fall, and if we don't sacrifice these men here, the communists will come to America, they'll take over the public schools, they'll teach socialism, you know, it's, you know, as if anything different there, you know. Got Americans teaching them there. Um, oh, well, you see, apparently communism's not so bad anymore. Because guess where they got the money to fund not only their welfare state, but also their little imperial enterprises in Iraq and Afghanistan? They went right to the Chinese communists and borrowed the money instead of taxing Americans because they knew what would happen over here if they did that. This is the same communist regime that was funneling the arms and the weaponry that killed many of these 58,000 American men and that's where they borrowed the money. I mean, how much more morally despicable can you get than that? And hypocritical. But that's the statist. Or, unless perhaps you look at Cuba where, you know, that's a communist regime. Uh, of course, it's a liberal's dream come true because everybody's equal you know, equally destitute. <laughs> and it's a conservative dream because they have military tribunals there and denial of due process and no criminal defense attorneys. But you see, apparently communism's not so bad there, even though they've got a 50-year embargo, hoping that someday they're going to succeed in ousting Fidel Castro from power. But you see, apparently communism's not so bad anymore because every time somebody tries to escape from Cuban communist tyranny, these statists, both liberals and conservatives, attack them on the high seas under the name of immigration controls, and they forcibly repatriate them back into communist tyranny. That's a statist for you. Now, we all know what they're going to do with this debt. And, and by the way, each of you owe, on average, $40,000 right now in that na the, your, your average part of that national debt. And it's growing every day. They've got a credit card that they're charging on your account and it has no limit on it. They're running up the bills every day. They're spending just this year alone $1.4 trillion more than what they're bringing in in taxes. That's your debt. A family of four, you got two kids, $160,000. You owe it. Because you see what's happening is the Chinese communists they know what's going on with this other part of this jugular vein that came into existence in the 1910s. See, the average American, he has no idea. This is the brilliance of the Federal Reserve System. You ask an average American, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a real reason why governments take control of educational systems. It's because they know the power to mold people's minds when they're children, and that mind remains molded all too often, all through adulthood. And that's what that big battle in Texas is all about over what's going to go into those, those socialist textbooks down there in the public schools. The liberal status are fighting the conservative status and they're saying, you know, we want our form of statism in these books. Because the average American, you ask him, what causes inflation? He will say, well, golly, you know, uh, grocery stores are causing the inflation. Yeah, you know, they're raising their prices over there. Or, you know, the service stations, you know, service stations are raising their prices every day. They're, yeah, it's that greed, you know, that's what's causing the inflation. We need some price controls on those people. <laughs> you see? But you see, the Chinese communists know better because they got a central bank too. And what they have told the federal government, the U.S. government, is don't even think about cranking up your Federal Reserve printing presses, which they're doing, to pay off this debt. In other words, to default on it, which they've done decade after decade. 
That's what's funded this machine, the income tax and the Federal Reserve. There's a reason why we no longer, Americans no longer walk around with silver dimes and silver quarters and silver half dollars. It's because they've debased the currency year after year. And the Chinese communists are saying, don't even think about it. We have loaned you dollars and we expect to be paid back in full-fledged, full force, full value dollars. And if they demand that, you can be darn sure the other creditors are going to demand it. There is a collision coming on the horizon. And my hunch is that the American people are going to rue the day when they permitted these imperial enterprises, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, and permitted the government officials to borrow the money to fund those things from the Chinese communists. But this is a threat we face. It is a threat to our economic liberty, to our financial well-being, to our economic well-being. That's the welfare state. In the middle of this perfect storm of the welfare state and the warfare state, you've got their favorite status government program, the one that's gone on for, what, 30, 35 years, the drug war, in which they have brought nothing but death and destruction to, to masses of people, destroyed lives with this war. And you know what it's all about? It's all about money and power. There's lots of people making money off this thing. There's judges on the take. There's prosecutors on the take. There's law enforcement agents on the take. You got CIA agents running drugs. You've got asset forfeitures in which they're stopping cars on the highway driven by poor people with cash and they're just stealing the cash. It's a classic case of highway robbery. They're saying if you don't like it, sue us, knowing that the poor don't have the money to hire a lawyer, especially after they've had their cash taken from them. This is the biggest money maker for them, and that's why they fund it, because they got no other rationale for it. Thirty years ago, they could argue, oh, well, we're going to stamp out drugs from society, and yet no, everybody knows they're not going to do that. Everybody knows that by now. It's ridiculous. But it is deadly and destructive. You've got the conservative status saying they're chomping at the bits to send the military down to the southwest. Do exactly what the Mexican military is doing along the border. Barging down people's homes, haranguing people, arresting people, killing people, and of course, waging war on guns. You've got the liberal status saying, person doesn't own his own body. We're going to punish him for ingesting these substances that he chooses to ingest. So you got all of this, these three wars. And, in, in, and embedded in this, these three wars is the concept of individual responsibility. Because you see, a statist hates that concept. Ah, yeah, conservatives will preach it. You know, they go back to Ronald Reagan's old General Electric speeches, and with freedom comes responsibility. And they always, they always had these cute little freedom mantras that they got back in the 50s. But when you hold up individual responsibility to a conservative status or a liberal status, it's like holding up a cross to a vampire. I mean, it's like, ah, don't do it. I mean, look at 9-11. Who do they blame for 9-11? They don't take responsibility for what their foreign policy produced. That's the last thing they're going to do. You see, it's all freedom's fault. You see, they blame it all on freedom. The terrorists hate us for our freedom, which is maybe why they're taking away our freedom, to, so the terrorists won't hate us anymore. <laughs> so, well, let me tell you what happened here. In, in, when, when the Berlin Wall came crashing down, the Soviet Empire dismantled. The military and the military-industrial complex and the conservatives that love big government and foreign affairs, they, went, they started freaking out big time. People were asking, hey, what do we need a big Cold War military machine for? Cold War is over. What do we need NATO for? What do we need all these overseas bases for? Maybe it's time to start dismantling this, at least significantly reducing it, lowering taxes. They freaked out. They're entitled to their ever-increasing military budgets. It was their right to keep these things. They said, oh, we'll, we'll fight the drug war, and they send military down into, into, into uh, Colombia. And they said, and we'll be the world's global cop. And the first thing they do, they turn on their old buddy, their old friend, their old ally, Saddam Hussein. 
Now that always shocks America. You, you mean the U.S. government was partners with Saddam Hussein? They called him a Hitler. <laughs> well, duh, yeah. They were partners with the guy they called Hitler. You see, when, when they invaded Iraq, you remember all the big scares in the beginning, you know, WMDs, WMDs, oh my gosh, the WMDs are going to be fired on us. And they, you know, the status legs were quaking and Saddam was going to come and get them, just like the terrorists and the communists and so forth. Well, the UN inspectors kept saying, there's no WMDs, he's destroyed them. And the conservatives were making fun of them. Oh, Inspector Clouseau, the UN inspectors don't, they're incompetent. You need the CIA in the, in the military. And Saddam said, bring in the CIA. They can search anywhere they want. No, we need the troops. The troops are expert searchers. And Well, of course, we all know that, that there were no WMDs. But how did the, why were they so certain? Why were US officials so certain that they were going to find these WMDs? Well, let me tell you why. They had the receipts. <laughs> you know? they, they were the ones that had delivered them to him, including poisonous gas. The U.S. as well as other Western countries when he was part of their team. And why did they deliver him those WMDs? So that he could use the poisonous gas to kill Iranians. Now, why did the U.S. government want to kill Iranians? Well, because the Iranian people had had the audacity 11 years before, to oust the US, the U.S. installed dictator of Iran, the Shah of Iran, who had spent 25 years torturing Iranian dissidents with the full support of the CIA. Which isn't surprising because it was the CIA that put the Shah into power 25 years before that in 1953, ousting the democratically elected prime minister of Iran in this CIA coup a man named Mohammad Mossadegh, who had been Time Magazine's Man of the Year. They installed the Shah, utilizing the torture techniques that they had just learned in the Korean War. They supported the Shah in maintaining order in Iran for 25 years until the Iranian people finally ousted them. A lot of Americans didn't know about this, but the Iranian people sure knew about it. And that's why they took those hostages from the U.S. Embassy. You know, they were saying, oh, it's about freedom. The Iranians hate us for our freedom. The Iranians were angry over what this government had done. In any event, they turn on Saddam. They kill countless Iraqis, including troops that belong to families, that had parents, that had siblings, and the anger is boiling. Because people in the Middle East are saying, what business, is this? Is you, uh, what business do you have over here? That one country's invaded another country because they've had a dispute. Who, who died and made you world cop? And after all, you know, they were not unaware that the U.S. government in its side of the world had invaded a bunch of countries, you know, Haiti, Grenada, Nicaragua, Mexico, Panama, the list goes on and on. A little bit of a hypocrisy there. But in the middle of this Persian Gulf War, the, the Pentagon comes up with a secret study and they say if we bomb the water and sewage facilities here in Iraq, this will help spread infectious diseases and illnesses among the Iraqi people. It's sort of like what we later heard in Katrina in New Orleans, don't drink the sewage in sewage infested water and so forth. Well, the, the Pentagon comes up with this study and says that's what will happen. So the order was given, bomb the facilities. And to ensure that the facilities were not repaired, they imposed one of the most brutal regime of sanctions, embargoes in history. It was virtually a total embargo. And sure enough, the Pentagon was proven right. Year after year, these sanctions lasted 11 years. Year after year, Iraqi children were dying in droves, tens of thousands. Two high UN officials, a guy named Von Sponek and a guy named Butler resigned in protest to what they called genocide. And, and all the time you could feel the anger in the Middle East rising, not just in Iraq, not just from the parents that were losing the children, but from just Muslims, Arabs and there they were saying this is horrible, the sense of, of futility, of helplessness, of being able to do nothing about it to break free of the sanctions. The idea was, well, if, we can, if Saddam will get out of power, 
This will solve the problem. We can lift the sanctions and well, Saddam wouldn't get out of power. He wouldn't succumb to these threats. Madeleine Albright, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, she expressed the official position of the U.S. government when she told the world, and especially the people in the Middle East, through 60 Minutes, an interview she did, she says, the deaths of half a million Iraqi children have been worth it. And that was her term, worth it. That reverberated through the whole Middle East. The cauldron of anger and hatred was boiling over. As early as 1993, there was an attack on the World Trade Center. It was treated as a criminal justice problem. It was no different in principle from what was going to happen eight years later. They didn't invade Pakistan where this guy was. They didn't bomb people. They didn't kill wedding parties like they've done in Afghanistan, where 99% of the people they've killed had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. And they haven't even caught the guy that they, that they say did it, planned it. But in Pakistan, they waited him out. One of the right things they did. They treated it as a criminal justice problem, which it is. And they caught the guy. The cops caught the guy. They brought him back to New York. They convicted him in federal court. No tribunals. And in his sentencing hearing, Ramsey Youssef says, it's not about freedom. It's about what your government has done to people here, including all the children you have killed. And that was only in 93. The sanctions lasted to the invasion. They had the unconditional support throughout that decade to the Israeli government, both military and financial. They stationed U.S. troops near Mecca and Medina, the holiest lands in the Muslim religion. It was all a message of take this. Take this because we're telling you you're going to take it. Humiliation, abuse, death, destruction. There was the, the blowback, the, the retaliation on the USS Cole. There was the attacks on the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And then there was the attack at 9-11. And people say, 9-11 changed the world. 9-11 changed the world. Didn't change anything. It was just one more in a series of, of attacks from people that are angry over what this government has done to them. The same type of abuse multiplied a thousandfold that the IRS and other agencies abuse Americans with. This was the anger that was boiling over. And what did the U.S. government do? They simply blamed it on freedom. And they said, we're going to use this as the excuse to invade Iraq. WMDs, they later switched that to say, we love the Iraqi people. We're here to save them and bring them freedom and democracy. Killing any upwards limit. Didn't matter. They had no upper limit on the number of people they could kill, despite the fact they said they loved them. So in other words, they used the invasion to accomplish what the sanctions had not been able to accomplish, the ouster of Saddam. They invade Afghanistan. They kill countless innocent people. It is the greatest terrorist-producing machine in history. Every day they kill 10, they produce 30 angry people. Sisters, brothers, sons, daughters, parents, grandparents, cousins. It's no different from what we would do if the Chinese invaded here. Some would cooperate with the occupation. Others of us would not. But it's all freedom's fault. You see it also in the welfare state. It's all freedom's fault. Remember the Great Depression? Oh, it's the failure of America's free enterprise system. We can't blame it on the Federal Reserve and what they were doing throughout the 1920s with their monetary manipulations because that involves questioning the beloved welfare state. The housing debacle? Oh, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these quasi-government agencies that are guaranteeing these speculative loans and... And uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the Federal Reserve that's lowering interest rates, trying to encourage people to make these home loans when they have no business making them, or economic regulations forcing banks to make high-risk loans. Oh, no, it's none of that. It's all because of greed and, and the bankers and speculation. Because, you see, they can't take responsibility. They've got to blame it on freedom. So you have all these storms. You've got all this darkness. You got this denial of responsibility. You got these threats to our freedom and to our well being. But, along with all this, has come opportunity. Because you see, for the first time, there's ever growing numbers of people that are asking questions. They're asking why this government spending is out of control, why the debt continues to skyrocket. 
what the role of the Federal Reserve is in all this. And as long as people are asking questions and they're not just robotically saying, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, then we got a shot. Because when people are asking questions, there's a good chance they may arrive at the right solution and that's where we enter the picture. Because you see, for decades, we libertarians have been warning Americans, this is the road these statists are taking you down, both liberals and conservatives. The road to big government, the road to statism, the road to serfdom, the road to moral debauchery, to national bankruptcy, which is where the Greek situation is now. This is the road to Greece, we have told them. And what were the statists saying the whole time? Don't listen to those libertarians. Don't listen to them. We can invade foreign countries, we can steal their oil, it can be a self-funding operation, it'll all be free. Just trust us. We can have welfare for you, free retirement, free health care, free everything. Don't worry, don't listen to those libertarians. Well, all of a sudden, people are starting to listen. Now, the status, of course, are saying, Look, we've got to come up with reform plans and, and, and a lot of the people that are asking the questions, their mindset is still in this concept of reform. How do we reform Social Security? How do we reform health care? And they ask us libertarians, what's your plan for Iraq? What's your plan for Afghanistan? They just don't get it. We don't have plans for Iraq and Afghanistan. We're not interested in saving their beloved socialist programs. We stand for moral principles, including the fact that it's wrong to take what doesn't belong to you, even when it's done through the political process. We stand for free markets. We stand for individual sovereignty. We stand for what it once meant to be an American, what it once meant to be free. We're not interested in saving Social Security. We're interested in repealing it and repealing it immediately. You couldn't find a better example of a, of a greater anti-family program than Social Security. And it's the same thing with health care. We're not interested in saving Medicare and Medicaid. We're interested in repealing them. That's the cause of the problem. We're interested in abolishing the departments of energy and agriculture and education and all the rest of the welfare state agencies and departments. Because you see, as libertarians, we believe in ourselves and we believe in freedom and we know that freedom works and we believe in other people as well. We don't have any doubts that children will honor their mother and father on a voluntary basis, that the market will provide the vehicles for health care for education and all these other areas where socialism has taken over. But at the same time, we value the concept of free will, the God-given gift of free will and freedom of choice. We recognize it's wrong to coerce compassion, to coerce someone into doing the right thing, to coerce someone into doing anything that involves the initiation of force against another human being. You see, in all this darkness, my friends, that has enveloped our land, there are flickers of light. Throughout the country, there are flickers of light. And those flickers are you, the libertarians. It is those flickers of light that are extinguishing the darkness. Even if you're the only libertarian in your community, you are lighting the darkness because there's other people coming to you and are attracted to you. There are certain segments of the status movement, they're incorrigible. Don't even think about converting them. You're not going to convert them. Smash their arguments, cast them into the, the trash, trash heap of history where they belong. But there's people out there that are questioning, that are seeking the truth. And that is where your light starts to shine. And as, all the, as these flickers start multiplying, the darkness is extinguished. And how do we do that? We do that with our weapons. Truth and principles and integrity. 
We never do what the conservatives did. They threw in the towel. They retained the mantras, you know, free enterprise, pro property, limited government. But they threw in the towel and they embraced big government and big socialism and big imperialism. We must never let that ha to happen. I've seen libertarians in this movement for decades saying, oh, we've got to compromise our principles. We've got to hide where we stand. We got to be taken respect, respectfully by the by the media. We got, we got to get votes. We got to conceal where we stand on issues and compromise and abandon them. Nothing worse could befall this cause. Nothing worse. Cuz who can have respect? <laughs> who can have respect for a movement that engages in that type of conduct? We happen to belong to, I mean, we ought to be thankful we're alive today. To, because we are participating in one of the grandest, most glorious, most honorable movements in the history of man. Our movement, the libertarian movement, the freedom movement, whatever label you want to put on it, ranks right up there with the movements for habeas corpus, Magna Carta, the petition of right, the declaration of independence, due process of law, the constitution. We've got nothing to apologize, to conceal, or whatever. It's the status that should be ashamed of their philosophy and ashamed of what they've done to not only the people of this country, people of the world. <laughs> if we maintain our principles, if we maintain our integrity, if we continue speaking the truth, I can't guarantee we're going to be successful. Life doesn't guarantee anything, but I can guarantee you that it's the only way to achieve success. It's the only chance there is. If we do that, we can confront these dangers courageously. We can overcome the statism that has enveloped our country, the darkness. We can make it through the storms. And we keep in mind that the darker and stormier it gets, as any mountain climber will tell you, Maybe an indication that we're closer to that mountaintop than we think. We continue doing that, we will seize the opportunity to lead not only the American people, but especially the people of the world to the highest level of freedom that mankind has ever seen. Thank you very much.